I will say that, and I think we'll get started here. Um, so I wanted to welcome everybody again, just uh, formally, to uh, day one of our conference. It's our second annual Grow Where You're Planted conference for military families. We're really excited to have uh, Jen Hockey with us today. Not only is Jen um, one of our amazing staff people here at MFSUS, but Jen is um, certainly a lifelong learner. The, the more I know about Jen, the more I learn about her learning. <laughs> <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, but that's the most fascinating thing to me because I love when people um, commit themselves to a lifetime of learning. So when Jen's not uh, out can in Hawaii as the MFS coordinator, she uh, is a lawyer with the Department of Justice in Ottawa. And uh, she's also training to become a genealogist with the National Institute of Geneal Genealogical Studies um, and has a great love of, you know, finding out her family history and, and learning in general. So that's what brought Jen down this path, I believe, is, uh, from her bio is what I understand and from what I know of her. I also know that Jen is very adventurous and likes to try new things um, and is a good uh, East Coast girl <laughs> um, and um, just generally loves, you know, spending time trying new things in Oahu where she's living right now since 2017. And uh, she has a blog about it as well, so I want to hear more about that at the end of your session today, too, Jen. Okay. Um, so just enjoy, folks, as Jen takes us through a little bit of um, her knowledge about genealogy and how to connect with our past, since our conversations this week are all about um, a season of connectivity. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you for putting on, uh, you know, I, Michelle, as many of you may know, is kind of a, uh, spearheaded this uh, conference, and I'm really excited to be part of it. And uh, thank you to Joanna. She's our uh, host and does all our virtual stuff. We couldn't do it without her. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Joanna, actually, to um, just uh, kind of monitor the chat a bit so that uh, if you do ask a question in there, I can uh, answer it because it's a little hard for me to uh, speak and uh, monitor it. So I'm not ignoring you, well, and we will get to you. And I just want people to know I will do a question and answer session at the end. So if you have any burning questions then, um, that's a great time to ask as well. So as uh, Michelle said, I uh, am a lifelong learner, and that's definitely true. Uh, when we moved here, I took a year off, and I decided that I wanted to pursue my passion in genealogy. I've always been interested in it. I got interested in my family history when I was uh, about uh, 16 or 17, and I really started to get into it in my late 20s. But as you can tell from my background, I've been pretty busy at school, uh, so I never really got to delve into it a lot until uh, I had that year off. And of course, you know, what do I do with a year off? I fill it with, let's start another uh, career path. And my career path is to become a genealogist eventually. Um, I will, uh, I do plan to do that when I retire uh, from the public service. So hopefully sometime in my mid 50s. Um, so me personally, in my own uh, genealogical experience, I have experience with Canadian uh, records, colonial New England, British records, and I do have some familiarity with French, Acadian and Swiss as well. Uh, so I have been able to push my family trees um, back about five to six generations on each line. And uh, on for some of my lines, I've been able to go back to the 15th and 16th centuries. And one of the reasons for that is my background is quite British, uh, where there are a lot of uh, records that are available. On here, you'll see uh, my first slide. Uh, these are pictures from my own uh, background. So um, my grandmother, my great-grandfather's family, my grandfather in a Spitfire in World War II, and a great aunt. Um, this, uh, the final picture was taken, uh, I believe, in uh, 19, I think it says it actually there, around 1908. So uh, some of the uh, examples of things you can find around your house or your parents' house, perhaps. So the topics I'm going to uh, start talking about today are, if you haven't done this before, here's how to get uh, started. And I'll give you some kind of steps for research. Also, organization, it's a really key thing to do. So if we have any people out there that love to organize or are gold personalities, they are going to love this. <laughs> um, also, um, I'll be talking about uh, you know where to look for these records. Uh, reliability, how to make uh, determinations on, okay, I've got all this information, what does it mean? Uh, make a, a good conclusion. Uh, so a lot of people get into genealogy because, hey, I have this, you know, 
family lore, the story about uh, where you're descended from royalty or whatever. And it's like, uh, chances are you're probably not, <laughs> but why don't we prove it? Uh, instead of, it, it's kind of about finding out what your family really was like and where you come from as opposed to a great story that might not necessarily be true. <laughs> Um, so uh, context can be part of uh, genealogy, such as uh, looking at social and local history of your families. I'm also going to talk about DNA and genetic genealogy, which are really hot topics right now. And I'm going to help you a little bit with your brick walls. Uh, brick walls are when you just can't seem to go forward or to prove something. Have some tips on, you know, maybe how you can, you can help yourself do, uh, do that um, and get through them. You may not be able to get through all of them, but hopefully you can do a few. <laughs> um, so why do people get into genealogy anyways? Like, um, and how uh, did genealogical records kind of first start being uh, created? So here I have a kind of an overview of what, basically what uh, genealogy is and how we do it. So we use oral interviews, historical records, genetic analysis, and other records to obtain information about a family. And we're trying to demonstrate kinship pedigrees of its members. Uh, pedigrees just means lineage or your family line. Um, and the results are often displayed in charts or written as narratives. So that might be the uh, end product of uh, your genealogical research. So, so throughout most of uh, history, kinship and descent were often the reason for creating and maintaining genealogical records. And their primary role was originally to demonstrate legitimate claims to power and wealth and to perpetuate the uh, power and wealth. But in the 19th century, family genealogy became more of a hobby as well. And many genealogies, uh, family genealogies and histories were published. Um, so in the U.S., several organizations emerged in that 19th century uh, period that began to gather genealogical records. Uh, and these included the New England Historic Genealogy, uh, Genealogical Society, and that actually still exists, um, as well as the Genealogical Society of Utah, uh, which later became the Family History Department of the Church of Latter-day Saints, which uh, most people know as Mormons. The uh, Church of Latter-day Saints really uh, spearheaded uh, kind of online genealogical research, um, and they created an extremely useful website that people still use today called FamilySearch.org. Uh, and it just, um, part of their religion is they need to know where they come from, and it helps to establish connection and family um, ties. So that was, uh, that this kind of genealogy uh, research uh, kind of grew out of that. And um, especially with the spread of the internet, interest in genealogy has really expanded because we have access to so many resources now. So instead of 20 years ago, you had to go to the actual archive or the actual parish or uh, the, you know, where those collections of those records that you need to look at. Uh, you had to go to them or you had to buy, a, you know, a compilation of that, which were quite costly. Uh, now we have a huge range of websites um, and we also have tons of societies and people are just finding a passion for this all over the world. Um, and in addition to helping, you know, individuals figure out their roots, genealogy can also offer a more detailed view of your family's role in the grand scheme of history, which a lot of people find very interesting. And people do get into ge genealogy for other reasons as well. Uh, it could be medical or health reasons. We see a lot of tests now that can um, test for, you know, medical traits, for, uh, for um uh, things that may run in your family and something that you should be aware of from a medical perspective. And there is, I'm actually taking a course right now on uh, family history and uh, genetic genealogy. It's really interesting and it teaches you how you can trace this and um, you can actually do a, a full study just on that type of um, information. Uh, I mentioned some people get into it for uh, community or religious obligation. Um, some people are adopted and they want to know who their family is um, from a biological uh, perspective as well as who is the family that they grew up with. Um, and we all have seen, I think, recently genetic genealogy or forensic genealogy uh, is 
leading to uh, many living people being uh, caught as a criminal um, and uh, to solve cold cases. I'm sure uh, people have heard of the Golden State Killer, and he was actually um, uh, caught through genetic genealogy. Uh, they 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 had a um, DNA from him, but it only matched on a public website to a fourth cousin or um, so far back that they had to reconstruct the genealogies to find the common ancestor so they could go down and find the actual person who did it. Yeah, so as, a, as um, yeah, it's a fascinating story and it's not the only one out there. Um, there's a new show uh, that started and there's only a few shows out there. Um, but it's Cece Moore, and she uh, does a show called Genetic Genealogy, and that's uh, what that kind of thing is about, is catching these people. Um, it could be decades later. So it's really interesting what genealogy can now be used for. Um, before I keep going, does anybody have any questions about anything I've said so far? Oh, okay. pretty good in the chat there, Jen, just, um, yep. just double checking, but I think it's uh, really fascinating to hear like different types of genealogy and I think people just chatting in the in the chat box about, you know, I've heard of that or that's new to me, it's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it, it's super exciting. I watch uh, so many genealogy shows, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> they're, they're super interesting. Um, so how do you get started? Um, this is, uh, you know, something that can be the hardest step for a lot of people because they just don't know, well, what do I do? So I put kind of a picture of a few uh, things that are around my house that uh, kind of got us started. Uh, the first one is um, the cover of a family Bible uh, for uh, my immigrant English immigrant ancestors. They came over in about the uh, 1844 to settle in Tilsonburg, uh, Ontario, and this is their family Bible. So unfortunately, it didn't have anything actually in it about births, deaths, and uh, marriages, although many do. But it was really interesting to just have something from them. Also, there's some letters here from my grandfather to his uh, mother uh, during World War II. And uh, just kind of talking about what uh, he went through, uh, you know, while he was over in, he served in Tunisia and in uh, Italy and a little bit in Morocco. So really interesting places and very interesting uh, things that he did. So it's really interesting to read about that because now I know a lot about my grandfather and his personality that I didn't get to see when I was uh, younger. And here's a picture of um, my great aunt, my great great grand my great-grandmother, and uh, I, uh, a woman that uh, came over from England in a, during World War II, she's actually a, a teenager, and she uh, lived here uh, to um, get out of uh, London while they were being bombed. So it's, it's very interesting, you know, what you can find around. So your first task, really, your first step, is to just look at what you already have. You might be surprised. Uh, look at your photos, look at, you know, those old books, um, ask your old, uh, older relatives if there's anything um, that they, especially if they're about to move, get your hands on what they're saying. <laughs> they might not want to keep anymore. Um, and, you know, like talking to older relatives is a huge part of genealogy and it's one thing I wish I had done more and you'll hear this from almost everybody. I wish I had talked to my older relatives more and, you know, put down their stories and um, just had that time with them because it's lost once they pass away. So, you know, the best time to start is now, right? Um, and I, this is a great thing to do with everybody who's got kids stuck at home, too, is to get them involved in collecting, you know, of this evidence, these stories, um, talking to grandma and grandpa or great aunts and uncles or uh, even just older aunties and, you know, aunts. Um, and as you find what you can, you try to organize into family lines and trees and you start gathering clues as to, you know, who th these people are, theories about, you know, where you want to search a little bit more. Yeah, like uh, um, Joanna is here saying she, uh, she wished she had talked to her parents about what it was like to live during the civil rights movement before they passed. Yeah, exactly. Like these, you know, our ancestors go through incredible historical events just like we are right now. <laughs> and not everybody writes things down um, 
or shares the, those things. And sometimes we're not great at asking those questions until it's too late. So if you got kids, get them started early. You can, you, they can do some of the work for you too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Allison's saying, do your great grandchildren a favor and write about your experience now. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and fill out your census. Absolutely. Censuses are, I will talk about those a little later. Those are key for finding um, our ancestors. And sometimes that's uh, the only thing you can find. So you definitely want to, you know, um, it's amazing what you can find out from censuses. It, it tells you a lot about people's lives. And we'll get into that a bit uh, later. So as I said, we're going to step one. I've put out kind of three steps and just the basics of each thing that I'm talking about under the steps. So the first one is identifying what you know by gathering family information. So definitely you can start sketching out your family tree, um, you know, interview, record your information, organize what you have. And then in step two, you're going to decide, well, what do I want to do with all of this? You know, do I, I have a lot in this person, so, but I don't have on this. Do I want to, you know, pursue that uh, person's, uh, you know, history? So you identify, usually families are a little bit better to uh, go after than individuals because it's easier to trace families unless you've got a single uh, person. Um, and you work from what you know backwards in time. So, you know, you go from your parents to your grandparents to your great-grandparents instead of going, oh, I really just really want to know about my, you know, three times great grandfather who I think was named this, uh, who I think lived here. Um, if you go back, you'll be able to, it's much easier to prove that you actually are related to that person. And uh, it's, it'll make your research much quicker uh, and uh, in, in ways, <laughs> uh, but much more solid and reliable as well. And then once you've, you've got a, you know, an idea of what you want to do, you can even start a research plan, which is, it could be notes on a page of, well, I want to know this, and I think these are the, the documents I need, or this is what I think is out there, this is what I already have, uh, and then you're moving forward that way. So it doesn't have to be extremely formalized. <laughs> and then you're going to select the records to search. So if you're a completely trying, you know, like starting out from scratch, it's a really good idea to check out um, things like uh, there's free articles. FamilySearch.org has something called wikis. Wikis are uh, just a little um, like uh, Wikipedia entries um, on different things. Like say you want to know about someone who lived in Canada in the 1800s. It would help you to find out, well, what's available back then? Um, you know, what kind of records are there even, um, even existed? And um, usually we start looking for the basics first. So you're looking for births, marriages, death records, censuses, that kind of thing. Um, and once you do get to look at that uh, record, and you can find it on paid subscription or free sites, um, or you could go to a library, they may have access to that kind of information. You can go to an archive. Uh, they have a lot of stuff available online as well as uh, in person. Then you're going to want to look as much as possible at the original image. Um, so a lot of uh, what you'll find is a transcription or an index entry saying, well, this is what this record says. Go look at the record if it's linked. Because sometimes people uh, do mistranscriptions, they make mistakes, they don't read things properly, and uh, what that transcription is saying, um, the image is saying, may not be true. So it's just a, a good way to kind of um, make sure your, ev your evidence, your record is really referring to what it says it does. And I use a lot of finding aids, uh, so indexes, uh, names, uh, directories. Uh, catalogs, inventories of records. Um, once you get started, you'll see that there are there is so much out there, and I am going to go into more detail about what kind of records are out there to help you. So I also just uh, kind of wanted to um, 
to point out not just family search wikis, the Find My Past and Ancestry also have articles, guides, they're all free, um, basics on genealogical research, and there's a lot of like magazines out there that you can uh, purchase um, about this. Um, one of the ones I like is Family Tree uh, Magazine because it covers Canadian um, a bit, American for sure, and a little bit of British. So those are kind of my uh, areas. Um, another place that's super great for trying to find out what records are where is Cindy's List. Cindy is C-Y-N-D-I. Um, it's this massive website that's broken down by topics and countries and it's, it's kind of like your go-to. If you really don't know where, where to start, go there and just go down to, you know, like you want to go to Canada and you want to go to Nova Scotia and it'll tell you, okay, well this, and it has links to everything. It is an amazing resource and one that I don't think a lot of people use enough, especially um, when you begin because it's such a massive thing, but it's just break, break it down. Break it down to, you don't have to look at the whole website, you just have to look at that one part that is relevant to what you're searching for. So once you've kind of selected what you're going to look at, you've got a little game plan, then you're going to go and get those records and search them. And as you do that and you look at the originals as much as possible, you're going to, you know, extract the information that's relevant to you. And it's really, really, really important to note that source, that record. Like, where did you find it? Uh, you know, um, it's like, you know, doing a bibliography or EndNote, uh, you know, back in school. Do that because it's going to save you time. Because uh, you do not want to have to try and figure out later where you got that, especially if you want to share this information with other people. And most people are not going to uh, believe um, or have a lot of uh, reliance on unsourced um, information. I don't know if you've ever gone on Ancestry um, or um, another site where there's family trees. You know, not only is there records, family trees are there too that people have made themselves. And I've almost given up looking at them at this point because so many of them are unsourced. So I don't know where their information is coming from. I don't know if I can rely upon it. So for family trees that I find, I never accept them at face value. Uh, and any good genealogist will tell you the same thing. They will use them as clues. Um, maybe they are right, but how can you tell if it, you don't even know if it's what it's based on. Is it based on their knowledge? Is it based on something that they heard? Is it, is it based on, well, I just found this this tree and the surname was right, so I decided it was my tree. Um, yeah, so take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt when you do see those online. Um, so I always keep copies of the relevant document, so you can scan it. Uh, you can make a hard copy, you can download it. Um, I keep a research log, just, you know, jot, jot down what I've already looked at, so I'm not repeating myself. Because uh, uh, once you get a lot of people in your tree, it's really easy to go, hey, did I look at that record? Did I, did I not? Um, maybe I should go back. Uh, so it's just to kind of avoid um, duplication. And when you're looking for the, at these records, if you're looking at a collection, so say you're on Ancestry and you're looking at military records, well, what do those military records cover? Are they Canadian? Are they American? Are they U.S.? What's their time period? You know, is that even going to contain something that you're interested in? Um, you know, perhaps the purpose, like uh, why it was created, may uh, influence what you're looking for. Um, so it's a good idea to kind of check out what you're looking at because then you're also not, you're not wasting time by doing searches in places where you're never going to find anything and it can be very frustrating not to find anything too. <laughs> and then step five is you're going to organize and evaluate the evidence. These all sound like very formal steps. You know, initially they will be. Um, as you do this more and more, it almost becomes uh, intuitive. You know, it's okay, I got to do this and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this. Um, so, you know, once you've got this, all these, your, your evidence, you're going to look at it. What does it say? Do I trust it? Um, are there any gaps? How do I fill those gaps in? What else do I need to look for? Do I need to seek, um, you know, professional help? Sometimes you have to. Um, you can update and expand your research plan and, 
or you can map it out or make a timeline. I, I do that sometimes because it really helps in finding patterns and conflicting evidence and uh, gaps that I want to fill in. And then you're going to repeat. That's pretty much your basic steps of everything you're you're going to be doing. So it's do all of this, repeat, do all, <laughs> repeat. So I, uh, I just added a few other things here to just kind of help you out in when you're doing this kind of stuff. I talked about uh, wikis, national, state, provincial um, archives and websites. You're going to find a lot there. The familytreemagazine.com, great. It has tons of stuff, free and also paid. Um, ancestry uh, sites in, are really great too. There's tons of guides, articles, forms. Forms are out there. I'm going to talk about those in a second. Lots of blogs on uh, genealogy uh, research. And some are specifically on, you know, a certain topic or an ethnicity. And also getting your family involved. Um, there, there's uh, a link right here that has got a, lots of uh, activities and suggestions that you might want to use. Um, and I personally use uh, a lot of what I'm going to call cheat sheets. Um, you can find them on almost any, anything. Like I was talking about uh, source uh, citations, and uh, I've got a little. Uh, I've got. A, oops, here. I've got a little um, quick. Well, it's called a quick sheet here, and it's citing online historical resources. So it's just you know the proper way to do it because at one point I'll probably publish, so I want to make sure that I have the correct way to do it. Um, but being consistent and being complete and thorough is, are your real goals on that. Um, I also have this old reading old uh, handwriting cheat sheet because uh, once you get further back, handwriting can be a real um, excuse my language bitch to read uh, because it's just it's it's done in such a, a different way or they form their letters and stuff like that in a different way like uh you know used to be that they had something that looked like a double f which is actually an s um so having things like this uh will help you so you're you're not looking at something and going i don't even know what this says um and also if you're working in another language you can get uh, cheat sheets for other languages too for like what's the German word for birth, what's the German word for marriage, what's the German word for death so you know what you're looking at. Um, you can do a lot more than you probably think you can uh, even if you don't speak the right language um, in the records that you're looking for. I also want to kind of point out that right now because of uh, COVID, there are a lot of these annual uh, conferences and uh, seminars uh, that are usually done in person, uh, which I, I would love to go to some of these. Um, anyways, this year, a lot of these are being done virtually, and some of them are completely free, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, one that's coming up really soon is called Roots Tech. So Roots, T and then Tech is T-E-C-H. And that's happening on February 25th and 27th to 27th. And it's, they're going to have a ton of different seminars and stuff. So great time to go look at what they have, register for maybe a session or two, and check it out. Uh, and uh, they'll have everything from beginners to advanced stuff on a huge variety of topics. So definitely a good time to kind of check out what's out there and free. Uh, because that is not going to be happening probably in another year, um, all, you know, hopefully. Um, so does anyone have children here where they would want to actually um, get them interested in this kind of thing? Uh, if you can just put, um, you know, yes or a check mark uh, in the box. Okay, so we do have a few. Um, Okay, so I'm going to suggest a few things that you can do with them right now um, or whenever you want to start. Um, yes, does someone want to say something? Oh, nope, okay. Um, oh, and Lori, you're asking how do I keep my info together and organized? Um, that's actually going to be the next topic I talk about, so you just got to hang on. Um, and I will definitely talk about that because it's really, really important. <laughs> Uh, so, Family Tree Magazine has a great uh, website with tons of suggestions and materials. Um, you can create a family website together. You can journal or scrapbook um, either, you know, uh, your family history or their, um, you know, 
how they're doing it uh, for your kids. Uh, maybe you want to find out what day of the year, uh, the week you were born. Um, there's uh, look up perpetual calendar in Google, and it will tell you. Like for example, I found out I was born on a Thursday. Um, you can have children interview relatives. You can make it a game or a series of challenges. Um, and I'm going to post two. Um, I think if I can, I'm going to post two um, links into. I might not be able to do that. No, I can't access it right now, um, but I will do it at, at the end. Uh, I have two uh, good um, links to things that you can do with your, your kids as well. Jen, I really like the idea of um, interviewing family members because mm -hmm. as a kid, um, I was fortunate enough to grow up with my great grandma. And she lived through the Halifax explosion and the Great Depression, and she had a really interesting she had a really interesting story. And so one of the things I regret is I think that as a bratty teenager, I recorded over the tape recorder um, version I had you know done for a school project. But I know the story well enough to relay it. But I want to be able to pass it along to my kids who won't have the opportunity to meet her. So I think interviewing somebody and making sure it's in a place or kept in a way <laughs> that um, I wish somebody had ever reminded me how special that was. Um, yeah, that. and it, 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 that's great, Michelle, because it, it's true. Like as kids, maybe as uh, younger kids, when you do your family history projects and stuff in school, um, you're kind of interested for a while. Teenagers, yeah, less so. Um, and then you, you know, you get into your 30s or 40s where you kind of want to, you know, do this sort of thing, and you're like, damn, I, you know, where is that? Um, or oh, I taped over it, or um, I didn't realize how important that was. Yeah, I just thought she wouldn't be here. Yeah. You know, to regale yeah. the story for year after year, and then we just take that for granted. So I think starting with our kids now, um, you know, when we when we have the opportunity to have those people in our families is super important. So I really just wanted to pop on to say I really enjoyed that idea because it struck me. Oh, great. And you know what? I was thinking, you know, um, like I do this a little bit with my own nephews because uh, one of them had a family history um uh, projects that they needed to do. So I really enjoyed doing that, but I got them hooked a little bit because I tell them about our more interesting ancestors to try to, you know, hook them in. And then um, I get them to talk to like grandma and grandpa, um, you know, ask them questions. Um, and, you know, now with Zoom and everything, um, it's maybe a way to get your kids kind of uh, interacting with the older generation a bit more too. And uh, if they're old enough, you know, they can write down what they heard. Um, but that doesn't stop you, uh, you know, Michelle, or anybody who's had that kind of experience of writing down what you do remember, because it's, that's better than nothing. Um, I'm just going to go on then to the next thing, and this is rookie mistakes to try and avoid. I have done everything probably more than once, um, which has uh, resulted in a lot of uh, wasted time, duplication of effort, wasted money, or at least uh, paying double for things sometimes. So we're going to go into organization, which will help as well. But these are the things that can burn you out and that can um, just not make your conclusions as good as you can. For example, jumping to conclusions that aren't supported by what you're actually seeing. And, you know, accepting family information and stories as facts at face value. They may not be. Maybe they are, um, but it's better, you know, to figure that out and pass on that story as fact, um, unless you're like, nope, we just want to know that story. <laughs> we don't want to actually know what the real thing is. Um, expecting too much and giving up too quickly. Uh, this is something that you might find a lot to begin with. But there will be times where you just get, oh, my God, there's just so much. And that's why you need to have kind of like a start small and work up to things. Um, have uh, It's a really great idea to just kind of start with a smaller project, build up your confidence, see if you really like doing this kind of thing, and have an accomplishment. And that will help you and keep you motivated to go forward. Um, uh, something about organization is uh, if you're not a good note taker and you're not noting your source fully and then you're not kind of keeping it organized, that can uh, also um, hurt you. 
Yeah. <laughs> like this, Allison, don't forget to cancel your free trial of Ancestry. Yeah. Ancestry is an awesome place to go check it out. Go do definitely try their free trials. Um, they have uh, weekends and 14-day uh, trial, uh, free weekends and 14-day trials quite often. Um, and it's a great way to figure out do they have what I need? Do they, you know, or is this not the, the spot for me and I should be looking at a different website? Um, but yeah, if you don't cancel your, uh, your trial, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to be paying for it. Um, I personally have an ongoing, um, one, uh, one because I use it a lot for my, uh, my schooling and training as well as my own research, but it's not for everybody and it can be pretty expensive and there's lots of free stuff out there. Um, so. I talked a little bit more about some of these other rookie mistakes, um, but don't assume that no record exists of a, uh, an event if you didn't find it in your first search. It could be that you're not looking in the right place. It could be that it's not digitized yet uh, or available online, but it could be in another six months or a year. Um, so yeah, don't, don't give up easily. Some, some of these things do take a lot of uh, searching, but I can't describe how awesome it is when you figure out something, you find something you've been looking for for a long time. It's a, it's a good feeling. It's a very good feeling. <laughs> um, also, you're going to find conflicting or contradictory evidence, and you're going to have to deal with it. Um, and also, sharing your research. It's a really good idea, um, especially if you're doing this for future generations. It doesn't mean you have to have a publicly available, accessible family tree. There are ways to keep things private but still share. But it's definitely a good idea to share your research because it, it, this is the way of you perpetuating your family history um, and finding other people and maybe finding more uh, information because other uh, relatives may be doing the same sort of uh, research that you are doing. Um, but, you know, it avoids losing all of that hard work too. So I think, you know, what I'm trying to say with those rookie mistakes to try and avoid is that as much as you want to jump in and just go, a little time, uh, you know, taken at the beginning is going to save you a lot of wasted time and effort and money, as well as maintaining um, a consistent approach and a consistent way of organizing. Um, it's just, it's going to make this an, um, probably a more enjoyable um, uh, hobby for you to do. So we're going to go on to organization. So organization is something just start it with the first <laughs> first time you start doing it or try to catch up really, really quickly. Um, it's because again, that will save you a lot of wasted time and effort. And it's really hard to kind of get caught up. And you know what, maybe you don't get caught up, but you start organizing whenever you can and just keep it up. And you can adapt as you go. If you find that something, you need something more, add it. This isn't a static um, thing that you're doing, uh, unless you are really good at figuring it out right away and just keeping it uh, going. So how you save your research and organize it, it's going to be personal to you and what works for you. But there are tons of resources out there. Uh, and you shouldn't overlook all of the free and reasonably priced templates forms, programs, and even classes out there that can help you. Um, they can help you find a method that works for you. And I'm going to talk a bit about mine, so at least you have uh, an idea of something that, uh, you know, some people do. So personally, I do rely most heavily on my computer, and I have invested in genealogy software to organize my research. Most people do now work electronically, um, but I also uh, keep, in addition to that, genealogy software program I have. I also have an area in my computer uh, just to save the images that I scan, uh, research charts or spreadsheets if I use them, um, and I sort them in files in a folder um, that starts with the surname. And then in there I'll have subfolders uh, on each family group and I name my files in a consistent manner so I can immediately find things very quickly. Like, you know, surname, first name, um, you know, uh, if I have, and this will happen quite often, you have uh, people with the same name. Uh, you can put their dates of birth and uh, death to, you know, go, this is the one you're looking at. 
Um, and then, you know, what is it? What's the document? What's the image um, that is there or the location? Whatever works for you. Um, and then just be consistent with it. Um, and I also have a binder system. So I do do some hard copy. And the reason I do that is um, I have a, uh, a bunch of things like heirlooms or original documents that even though I've scanned, I want to keep the original document, like a marriage certificate, um, you know, or an award uh, or something like that, um, or original photos. I keep uh, as well, and I do take a uh, handwritten note sometimes too. So I do keep uh, some of those if I've worked out um, like a problem or something like that. Um, I also, uh, and this would help, uh, you know, uh, Michelle uh, with uh, what you were talking about about erasing things. I put my USBs that I back up everything on, and uh, my hard drives. I put, I have them in um, with my binders in a designated plastic bin because uh, hard copy is really good at not be not being able to be destroyed unless like in a flood or a fire but I want to make sure that I, ha I protect it as much as I can so I actually have a pouch a fireproof pouch that I have as well that I put these these things in um, because I frequently will back up my work uh, and you, you definitely, that's something that you want to do. And if you use electronics, um, then it's much easier to kind of keep everything in a small place together. Um, but the types of like heirlooms and stuff I have are things like, um, I have uh, engraved silver bracelets, uh, engraved cigarette lighter for my great, great grandmother, books, um, a set of dolls from the 19th century uh, that my grandmother had that had been handed down in her family. I have pieces of furniture, you know, small pieces of furniture, some jewelry. Um, it can be whatever that you have, but you want to protect those things. Uh, but again, you can also organize them. So my binders are organized by uh, family name, surname, or family line. Some of them have a couple of uh, in there. Um, and uh, I put things in plastic, like little folders or um, that kind of thing. Um, I try to make sure that they're as invulnerable to loss as possible. Um, so for me, I use what I call a blended system. Um, and it sounds like a lot of stuff, but it's not that bad once you, you get it kind of set up. Uh, it's just, uh, and you don't have to do all of this to begin with. You know, uh, to begin with, you may just, uh, you know, want to save things on your computer or have like a, a plastic bin or a binder that you put stuff in. Uh, so this is, you know, it grows as your research grows. Like when I started out, I knew maybe 35 of my you know ancestors and family members and now it's in the thousands so organization is also key for that you know how easy it is to keep 35 or 50 people in your head um it's very different from how that is when you have thousands of people that you're trying to deal with um and to um find you know like oh i'm going to work on this person to get today so i need to go find them and uh you know start off uh, not from scratch. So I'm going to talk a little bit about software and the advantages as well as hard copy. So software has the advantage of being able to be searched, shared easily, and can be uploaded to search databases and sites. You can also share your family tree very easily because you can make something called a GEDCOM. A GEDCOM file is basically all of your um, family tree and text that can be shared with someone else uh, uh, who has a family, you know, uh, his, uh, a genealogical software, and they can, you know, use that. And I've done that to share portions of mine because I work uh, sometimes with other researchers. Uh, so it's a great way to do that instead of trying to just hand somebody, oh, here's my family tree, but it's uh, written out. So uh, it, I find also super easy to update, easy to back up. It, and it has the capability to produce reports and charts um, that you can use as well. So I am a huge fan of software uh, for doing this type of thing. Um, it's a little bit of a layout at the beginning, but it uh, it tends to be. I think mine was about 100 bucks, and I've had I've been using it for a decade. Um, I've done upgrades, but I've done two upgrades. But um, it's not that big of an outlay if this is something that is going to be kind of like a lifelong hobby. 
um, or something that you're going to have a lot of people that you need to organize. And of course, hard copy has the advantage of never being of that, you know vulnerable to data loss, uh, and it can be organized or customized to your own personal needs and wants. Um, so um, that kind of thing is like you know photocopies, notes. Um, you may have a ton of books. I have a uh, I've started a book uh, library for a lot of my stuff, and I also have an electronic library of uh, things that I use as well. So organization is going to, as I said, be kind of you know what you personally want. Um, but there's lots of um, things that you can do outside uh, look to for examples of how you want to do it. It's just um, at the end of the day, have an organization system and stick to it. Um, and if you need to shift it, hopefully you can shift it in a way that you don't lose all the work that you've done. Um, it should be something that you can add to as opposed to completely start from scratch. Um, and things uh, to kind of keep you organized are things like naming conventions that I said, you know, how you um, you organize stuff. Like I do it by surname. That's just the way I do it. And then by family, like a couple or a family group. Um, and then uh, by dates if I have to. Um, and then by maybe location or type of uh, record. So in being consistent with the organization is good. If you develop an abbreviation or color coding system, uh, color coding is great. Um, you have a little key there uh, so that you uh, don't ever get tripped up by your own personal organization style. Or if you have someone else working with you, they'll be able to figure it out too. Or if you hand down your research, it's uh, if someone's not going to be like, I, I don't understand. I don't. I can't find anything. I don't know what I'm doing. So uh, it's good to kind of um, have that little key there. Um, and uh, for organizational uh, stuff, or actually for a lot of uh, project ideas, uh, if you like Pinterest, there are some great uh, you know ideas there for family organization, uh, family history organization too, um, and it has things like forms and stuff like that. And when I talk about forms, I mean how you're extracting the data that you have in the records that you're looking at. So how you know how do you put keep track of your information? So things like censuses and stuff like that, the uh, forms are really good to use. So I uh, I keep talking about my family tree. Um, I don't know how well you guys can see this, but this is a screenshot of my. Uh, um, of one of my uh, screens uh, for one of my ancestors who are actually uh, their descendants of the May uh, from, that came over the Mayflower. So I was like, oh, that's kind of exciting. And I have a famous ancestor. Um, of course, never heard of him before I did this research, but you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so I have his name. I have the daughter that I'm descended from. And here I have on the right hand side, you can see like the images. It's called Media in this uh, particular one, Family Tree Maker. And this is a Mac program, but they do have a Windows version as well. Uh, so you can see all of the documents that I'm basing um, this genealogy on. So I know that this is the person that I, I'm uh, talking about. Um, and the bottom, there are the children of the couple. Uh, this is Mary Allerton and Thomas Cushman. Uh, so this is, you know, like people that Mary was born in 1611 in the Netherlands and then uh, came over on the Mayflower in 1620 at the age of four. Uh, so people like this are great too because usually there's a, a published genealogies that you can look at and um, it, it gives you a lot of information all at once. Uh, but yeah, it was really interesting to do this, but as you can see, there's also, I, I don't know if you can see that there's little green leaves and little blue boxes um, next to some of the names. This is great because it's integrated with the, the ancestry site as well as with the family search site. So it instantly gives me um, little hints and I can just click on the hint and it'll take me to a list of uh, family trees or records or both, um, that are available for that one person. So I have, uh, 
some active ones here because uh, those are family trees that I'm not so certain are completely correct and I don't want to merge my results uh, or merge my person with them. Uh, but I can if I do like uh, the record and I think that, yep, that is my person and is reliable and I want it. Um, I just have to download it right to my um, my genealogy program and it will appear over here on the right hand side in my media. So uh, this is for me makes things so much easier and there are there's a place for notes in here, uh, both notes like stories um, or summaries. I tend to do summaries about uh, my uh, people and our research notes and you can do task lists. So you can figure out what, what do I need to find next. Um, there's biographical information um, that you can see and um, it's just, it's a really fantastic for me um, thing that I use, but other people use different ones. Um, and there's always, every year, uh, in quite a few of the magazines that are uh, online as well, there's always um, the top, you know, 10 um, genealogy software uh, programs this year. So uh, that's kind of how I've done my research and some things is just read a few of those articles. They'll tell you what are the advantages and disadvantages of them. And then you can pick which one you want to use. Um, like I, I don't know if I could have done my genealogy to this point with, you know, the thousands of people that I've done without something like this. But some people do. They do it all in hard copy or all, uh, you know, on computer. Um, not sure that uh, I could do that. A lot of people, however, started 40 years ago when there weren't computer programs like this. So uh, the great thing about this is I can also on uh, the Ancestry um, website, I can load or sync my, my family tree there and other people can look at it and uh, they can contact me or I, well, actually I have a private tree um, and uh, because I have a number of trees going on. So you can, you know, adjust the privacy that you want on these sites. Because I'm going to talk a little bit about privacy later and, uh, you know, there's a lot of family information out there. These sites don't normally share living person family information. Those are usually blocked. Um, or you can block them yourself. Um, and some people just choose to have, yeah, I have a tree, just contact me and I'll share my information with you. So that's just the way I've chosen to go. Does anybody have any questions? Or is that like too in depth and it's like, okay. Okay. Oh. Well, thank you, Steph, at least it's interesting. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to move on then, and I'm going to uh, talk about records. I'll give you a quick, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, my water, uh, you know, coffee mug, that is one I had done here. Um, it's a resin mug by a local uh, military spouse. Um, you know, support local and support military. So I had that done. It was like 30 bucks, and this is a Wahoo, and it's got the 2017 to 2021, which is the, you know, dates of our posting. So we're going forward here, um, talking about records. What are you looking for? What is there out there? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the big five, or these are the ones that for me are the big five um, that I always want to look at and are usually the most available or the most useful and helpful um, to me. So vital records, vital uh, about vital events at first. They were church records, which you'll see below, which are parish records. And then around the mid 19th century, quite a few countries started to have civil registration. And civil registration um, requires everyone to um, register the birth, their marriages and their deaths. Um, so those are super useful uh, from a genealogical standpoint because normally they have the next generation in there. Um, there's more um, information than just about the, um, the person who was born or married or died. So these are kind of where you start. And they are available through so many different <laughs> places. Like you can go to, in Canada, provincial uh, vital uh, statistics or civil registration um, 
like sometimes it's archives or departments in, in provinces. Uh, you can uh, look for them there. In uh, Britain, you go through the general register registrar's office and um, uh, you can, uh, I have a ton of those, uh, and you can just order the uh, the certificates and then you have an official, you know, uh, record as well. Um, it really depends on what, where you are, the jurisdiction that you can go and get these, but a lot of the paid sites have, um, all of the paid sites have, you know, vital records on them. Um, and then we have church records, which are the, par they're usually called parish records in most, uh, you know, um, British, um, sometimes they're translated that way for Western European and uh, North America. Those are what you're going to find. Um, and they didn't register so much the birth, they would register the baptism, the christening, whatever was that first um, thing that they used in the religion. Then they would have um, marriages, but they could have bans as well. They used to call bans um, for three weeks prior to a marriage in many uh, in many of the British um, countries. And then they'd have burials. They wouldn't have the deaths necessarily, so burials. So older records, uh, church records, will show you um, not necessarily the actual dates of births and deaths. It's more um, the christening, or it's the religious. Um, part of the um, event that you will find there. Um, also, um, there are censuses. So uh, censuses are huge. You should never uh, not look at these uh, because they are the ones where you'll likely find your ancestors if you can't find them anywhere else. Um, and they're, they're available like in so many places from archives to paid sites to some free sites. It just depends on which ones you're looking at. The older ones tend to be a little more available than the newer ones. Um, and to give you kind of an idea of what's out there for in a couple of countries, uh, 1790 was the start of the censuses in the US. And then they have them available until 1940. Um, except for the 1890 census, because that was unfortunately destroyed, I believe, in a fire. Um, Canada started in 1871, uh, and right now we have uh, censuses available until about 1921. So um, you can go online and find those. Uh, they're great. Uh, I've, I've found a lot of stuff in them, uh, because they're a great indication of um, kinship, of relationships as well as of location in time. Uh, and a lot of them, as you go further along, will have more and more information in them. I'm gonna show you two censuses, uh, one from 1841 and one from 1921, and you'll see a big difference in the type of information that they uh, have. Um, so England and Wales started their censuses in 1841. And uh, right now they're published up until 1911 with the 1921 census being a, coming available in 2022, as they have a, a, a 100 year rule uh, for their censuses. So when you are searching censuses, um, you might have to try different ways of spelling. <laughs> You're gonna have to do this uh, quite often, especially if you have a, uh, a name that can be sound very different when it's said, as opposed to when um, it's written because uh, spelling was not standardized really up until about the 20th century, maybe the mid 19th century. So there's lots of ways to spell people's names and you will probably come across quite a few of them in your research. Um, also watch out for ages in censuses. Sometimes they ask people to round up or down. Sometimes people just outright lie um, and uh, they're, you might see like a consistency throughout, say you're looking at a person throughout 50 years of, um, of uh, censuses, but it, it can be pretty common to find some really interesting uh, um, age ranges <laughs> for people in uh, censuses. Um, and censuses, because they're information that are taken down by a census taker, and not necessarily um, provided by the person 
um, that the information's about, uh, it may not always be completely uh, right what they write down, um, and mistakes, of course, happen too. So you take censuses, like they're a great way to kind of situate a person in time, but I wouldn't take their age or their birth date necessarily as truth. Or if it tells you where they were born, that's a clue, uh, it may not actually be right. And later on, uh, it wasn't just about population censuses, which is what we tend to see, the, the list with the people's names. Um, there were other ones that accompanied a lot of these uh, censuses, uh, such as agricultural or like rural farming uh, censuses. So you could tell a whole bunch about, um, you know, your grandfather who owned a uh, farm and how much it was, it was and how many people he employed and how many cows he had and how many horses and that kind of thing. Machinery, like it gives you a really good idea of the type of life that they had and the wealth that they had um, and, you know, what they did. There's also uh, ones for social st statistics, for mortality, for industrial manufacturing or commercial uh, schedules. So you can find out a lot more than just where someone lived. You can uh, find out a lot about perhaps their occupation and their land as well. And unfortunately, in the uh, U.S., before the Civil War, there were also slave schedules as well. Um, they don't make it that easy to uh, to find African American ancestors that were uh, in bondage, but uh, it may be possible sometimes to trace them through those. And the, you know, places that you'd find these are, are uh, in archives, uh, like Library and Archives Canada has uh, many of them. Uh, Ancestry has a ton of them. Find My Past does. Uh, US wise archives as well. I do a lot of Google searching sometimes when I'm not quite sure where something is, uh, and it's amazing what you can find that way too. So never, never, never uh, <laughs> think that Google's not going to be part of your your research. It, it can be, and it can be very useful. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about immigration records. Uh, this is something that maybe not is not the easiest thing to find, although a lot of the paid uh, uh, sites have them, uh, and the archives have them. Um, these are really great for people who live in uh, North America or Australia or any place where there's a lot of immigration. Because at one point, our families came to these countries, uh, you know, by getting on a ship, basically. And unless you're uh, completely of Canadian Indigenous or American indig Indigenous background, you're probably going to have someone who immigrated here. So it's a really great uh, way of um, finding people. And unfortunately, most countries where people emigrated from, so left, um, didn't uh, have great records um, or they were destroyed, um, such as in the UK. So the uh, countries that you're immigrating into, like Canada and the US, they have lots of records. And so that's a great way to kind of find out um, a lot about your ancestors, like when they got here, how they got here, where they came from, on what ship they came, who do they came, who did they come with, you know, who did they go to join? There's lots of information in these. Um, oh, bye, Isabel. Thank you for uh, coming on for a while. <laughs> um, although in some Scandinavian countries, there actually were. Um, uh, like for a while, a uh, requirement to register at the local police station before you left. I'm not really sure why, <laughs> but uh, they ha uh, so there are some Scandinavian countries that do have uh, departing um, uh, immigrants and passengers. Uh, they have them in their records as well. Uh, and you can find these in lots of places like the archives on uh, various uh, websites. Um, Ellis Island has a really good website uh, for people that went through there, and uh, quite a few people went through there. And there's also like border crossings for Canada. And for a period in the 19th century, a lot of people came to Canada because it's cheaper to come here than straight to the US. So we have a lot of people coming straight to Canada, or we have a lot of people coming to Canada and then walking over the border into the US. A little bit of a reversal of what's happening right now some days, I think. <laughs> and finally, we have uh, official records like court records. So um, these, it, it depends on the jurisdiction where you're going to find them. Um, and they are great if you have a criminal ancestor or anybody who had a brush with the law. 
or was involved in litigation, but it could also include things like land records. It could include probate records, which are administration records attached to wills. Um, and wills uh, may also be in, uh, in official records as well or court records. So uh, if you get to find a will, they are a bonus. Like they, they talk about, you know, who's still alive, what they got. Um, it's, they're fabulous. And so that's something, you know, don't rule them out. And I put on here on the, uh, the slide here, a large number of the alternate or non-traditional records. I'm just calling them that because they don't tend to be the ones that most people uh, necessarily use right away. But uh, military records are really awesome, especially, uh, you know, right now you can, if your ancestor was in World War I in Canada, you can get their attestation and full uh, service record uh, from Library and Archives Canada. Um, they are now all digitized and they are on their website. So really awesome. Um, like 10 years ago, I had gotten that for my grand, uh, my great grandfathers and uh, now the, everything's just available right there, free for the taking. So uh, definitely a great one. And World War II records are starting to come uh, become available uh, in some places as well. It just depends on how long the privacy legislation protects them. So uh, Beth is asking when I'm researching on average, how long do you spend? Uh, it must be really easy to get lost in searches. Yeah, it can. And that's why um, that step about what are you researching is really important to kind of focus you in because I'm someone who does like to follow the rabbit holes and see where things go. So I do, uh, you know, occasionally get stuck and I'm doing this for hours and hours and I'm like, huh, I never actually got around to, you know, looking at that record I wanted to because I get so interested in the other stuff I found. Um, when I do do my research, um, it does tend to be on the order of hours, but that, that, doesn't have to be like that. You can just have, like, look, I have a go and you do what you can in an hour. Um, and you just build on that and build on that. In some hours, you won't find anything. In other hours, you'll find a ton of stuff. Uh, it just really depends on, you know, where you're looking and what's available. Yeah, my lawyer training does kind of come in handy for this kind of stuff. And this is something I definitely go into the zone uh, where, yeah, I don't say much. I don't eat. I don't drink. I just do it. And for me, it's something I really, really enjoy. So that's good. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those um, hobbies that's like a lifelong hobby. Because uh, hard um, to fully research every single one of your ancestors, especially if you're someone who wants to know about aunts and uncles and cousins and all that kind of thing. Um, but for uh, you're right, uh, you know, um, Beth, it is my passion. Like, this is one of those things that I just really find interesting. Um, it's about stories, it's about families. Um, I love discovering new things about my family and I've now started to kind of start writing about it too. Uh, so I have thought about doing a blog and I may do one at one point. Um, right now I have another blog going on <laughs> about living here in Hawaii, but uh, it's definitely something I might do in the... Uh, Um, and I've actually, um, I produced a, um, or put together a kind of a heritage or family book for my father. He turned 75 last year. And it's, uh, you know, it's about our family history and the pictures and the maps and the documents uh, that I had found, not all of them, but I put them together in one book for him. And there's something solid that he can pass down to, you know, his grandsons if he wants to. And um, yeah, like I, I love sharing this kind of stuff too. And I'm really excited to have people to share it with because some people are not so enthusiastic about it as uh, as I am, that's for sure. <laughs> but they like to hear what I find. They just don't want to hear about how I found it. <laughs> uh, and so uh, lots of other things that you can look into. Um, cemeteries and gravestones. I'm one of those people who loves going into a cemetery and reading the gravestones. <laughs> uh, you know, when I go and visit like my, uh, my grandparents where they're, um, they're buried, uh, and I'm phenomenally lucky in that they're all buried in one singular uh, 
cemetery in Nova Scotia, which is not what most people's um, experience is probably going to be. But I like to go and look at others and see. I love when we travel to go look at other uh, cemeteries and see the gravestones, um, especially the older ones. Really interesting. Like we, when we were in Boston, Boston we went to the old burying ground and fascinating. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so court and criminal records, tax records, you can find out a lot about them there. Not the easiest things to find sometimes, but uh, yeah, probate and uh, wills, town records, uh, especially in New England. Um, they had, they did a lot of their record keeping through their towns, so you'll find a lot of stuff there. And in a lot of, uh, like in uh, some places in Britain, you might find that as well. Police records, I mentioned, you know, people emigrating from Scandinavia. I think it was Sweden and Norway, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, they had to register uh, with the local police when they were leaving. School records, uh, finding yearbooks is so much fun. And there's um, places like Ancestry are starting to really put these on or local, um, you know, local history societies and stuff might have these. And it's kind of fun to see maybe your, your ancestry school record, but you can also see like maybe their yearbook picture as well. Voting records and electoral polls, a lot of countries have these, and um, it's a great way to see in between censuses where your people are. You know, are they still in that area? Um, you know, and sometimes they put down exactly where they live, like their actual address. So that's kind of neat too, because you could use Google Maps to go, if it still exists in the same place, to go look at it. Um, and then newspapers. I love newspapers. Um, they are not an official record. You gotta kind of take everything that they say with a grain of salt, but they are great for clues, for stories, for um, just kind of rounding out your um, your ancestor's life. And especially if they lived in smaller places, uh, like towns and villages where there's a local, um, you know, happening section, uh, you know, births, marriages, and deaths would be in there, obituaries. Obituaries are an awesome um, thing to find, and nowadays, you know, you can find them online too, just at where the person's buried, uh, the website for the uh, for the funeral home. But uh, further back, you know, they were more in newspapers. They are still in newspapers now, but uh, it's great when you can find one of those. Or you might even find, you know, like just um, they were involved in something, or there's an accident, or a story about them. Or your ancestor was a local business person, and there may be ads for their store or their trade in there. It's kind of interesting when you find that kind of stuff. And of course, newspapers are just being digitized more and more and more, and just more and more available. And uh, we don't have one in Canada specifically, but there are like provincial and town one uh, websites that you can go, and some of them have archives. Uh, newspapers.com is great for US-based um, newspapers. There's a British newspaper archive available through Find My Past. Um, and there is a family tree wiki on Canada newspapers. So if you ever wanted to go look at that um, it, to find out kind of what you can find, but super interesting. Um, I, I uh, tell people a lot to, yeah, you maybe you want to check out the newspaper, the local newspaper. You might be surprised what you find. Um, and it might even help you with one of those family lore uh, stories, you know, if you can actually found, uh, find, oh, yeah, it was actually recounted in a newspaper. All right. So what kind of um, records are there and who created them? So. Most records were um, created for a particular purpose by a particular uh, organization. So in religious organizations, you're gonna find uh, baptism, christenings, memberships, um, maybe discipline sometimes if they you know, did something and they got kicked out, especially early Puritan. <laughs> Puritan uh, Puritans had a lot of uh, things going on bands, marriages, bur bur burials, meeting minutes, um, and they're organized by different ways depending on how that particular religious body is organized. You can also, there are, might also be business or employment records that can tell you more about your the occupation of your ancestor or, um, you know, maybe their, their work life, um, if they were in a union or a professional organization. Tons of societies uh, put out records, and it could be everything from fraternal uh, societies like the Masons 
to, um, you know, patriotic uh, societies, ethnic societies. Uh, they often have valuable records, databases, and membership lists. Um, I don't, I, I uh, don't uh, belong to a lot of them, but, you know, some are genealogical based or local history based, and I do belong to like the New England uh, um, Genealogical Society, as well as I actually joined the New York one because I had a bunch of uh, research to do with one of my re uh, my uh, lines of my family, and uh, so I've been kind of, you know, I just joined them for like a year. Sometimes I joined them for longer. Uh, when I lived in Ottawa, I did some stuff with the British one there. Um, so societies are a really good uh, kind of thing to look into. And even if you don't want to join one, you should check out their um, for where your ancestors lived, their local um, society, because they may have uh, things online that you that you can access that aren't available anywhere else, uh, including records. Um, tons of institutions, of course, have records, uh, and they're usually repositories for specific places or institutions, um, and they um, generally like to uh, create finding aids, like catalogs, indexes, and inventories to help you find uh, information. So it's always kind of great when you see uh, records and in institutions, like our archives as well. And one thing about libraries. I don't know if you uh, know, but a lot of libraries have free access to genealogical paid sites, uh, especially one called Heritage Quest, which is really great for the states, and, and Ancestry. So public libraries are surprisingly, not all of them, but quite a few of them have access to that kind of thing. Uh, you just need a library card. Of course, a lot of the records that we look at are the government uh, records, like vital records, land ownership, court documents, military records, censuses, of course, um, which are usually done in a 10-year period, but they could be, there could be like state or provincial or regional uh, ones that happen um, kind of like in the middle of the 10-year period. Uh, so sometimes those are super uh, helpful. And there can be government records at all levels, from you know municipal, local, district, regional to national. Um, and families, as you know, when we started out this, I was saying go collect what you can find. Um, that's available in your actual um, in your actual uh, family, and like family bibles. Sometimes they have a list of everybody that's been born, you know, for the past um, you know hundred years. It's Great. You may find journals or diaries, letters. Uh, I showed you a few uh, that we have in our family. Tons of photographs. Hopefully, they wrote on the back who the people are. Um, you know, albums. You could have heritage books already made and heirlooms. So these are the types of things that you could be looking for and what's out there that will help you in your uh, genealogical uh, research. I want to check my notes. Probably check the time too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've covered like uh, I think I've covered pretty good, you know, sources of where you're going to find stuff. And um, attached to the um, the back of my presentation is uh, two appendixes. One is about uh, some you know basic general sites. Uh, some are free, some are not, um, that most people kind of start off with and where you're, you're likely to be able to find lots of information. And then the next one is about kind of country or region or ethnicity specific um, sites that you might be, or uh, resources that you might be able to use to get you started out on. So hopefully that will be super helpful for you. Um, and also, of course, take advantage of the paid subscription sites, uh, you know, free 14-day trials or um, and see what you can get from there. Uh, the problem with those is you may not be able to access the documents that you were looking at or your tree um, and everything attached to it after you're no longer a subscriber. So um, that's another reason why I kind of have my own genealogical uh, software because I, you know, I'm not dependent on anything else. So here is an example of an, um, I believe this one is a British, yeah, it's a British um, census. It's from 1841, so it's one of the earlier ones that they had. And in here, there's not a lot of information, 
but it's pretty typical and it's actually pretty readable. Um, you may not be huge in your screen, but it's actually readable. <laughs> and it's uh, telling you who uh, is, are the inhabitants of Fleet Street. And it'll have the name, uh, normally they'll start with the head of the household, which is normally a male, although it could be a female, maybe if she's widowed or um, uh, is finding herself single for some reason. Um, and then you'll have, I'm actually gonna put my glasses for this one because I can't see it that well. Um, then you'll have relationship. So you'll see here head, wife, son, you know, head, son, son. So at least this is one where they actually show you the relationships. In earlier ones in some places, you have no idea. who. It could just be like one person. It's like, there's five people in my house, two are female, three are male. Um, and um, they'll have the ages. They'll have, here you get to see the occupation, which is great. And then where born. So this can uh, provide you with a lot of information in one shot. But if we go forward to a 1921 um, population census from uh, Canada, this one is from Nova Scotia. And uh, it, as you can see with all of the columns and everything, provides a lot more information. And these, you know, like if you have them and you're looking at them online, you can, you know, uh, download them, you can expand them, you can see them better. I can't really do that on this particular uh, one, but at least you get an idea. And this has not just, you know, a first name and last name, and it has what their relationship is and where they live, but it'll say, can they read and write? Because not everybody's literate. Uh, you know, what are their languages? Where are they from? Where are their parents from? How much money do they make? Uh, what is their occupation? And, um, you know, you can see here uh, in the bottom uh, part, there's one that says deaf. So uh, a lot of these, you know, as you go more forward in time, we'll have a lot more information on them. And uh, one of the things is what they, uh, you know, uh, viewed as disabilities that may have affected their ability to work because censuses were not created for genealogical purposes uh, so much as to figure out how many people were around, how many people were working, you know, uh, to make decisions uh, going forward on resources uh, and that kind of thing. So it, each time they did one of these, more and more information was, um, was put in there. And, you know, it'll have things like, uh, you know, languages spoken, you know, mother tongue, where you're from. Uh, this one looks like everybody was from Canada. So, um, 1921, not as much immigration is happening anymore. So it's not surprising. But they'll also have um, one about uh, religion. So religion's great because then it can, you know, oh, there's another place where I can look for some, uh, some information. Um, could have like uh, children are scholars or students. Um, then you can go, oh great, so they were in school, so maybe I can find their school records. So it's really interesting to see how much information you can get from uh, from this kind of stuff. And you know, the further um, closer in time that they are, the more accurate they tend to be. Although sometimes uh, the spelling, this like spelling has become more standardized by this uh, point, but um, there are, of course, mistakes made sometimes. <laughs> Although less less lying about ages, I'm hoping. Um, they're not rounding up at this point. And is the wife listed as an occupation hard to see? Yeah, um, it, the wife can be, or it can be, um, you know, housework. It could be housewife, or working in the home, or it could even be blank. It really depends on the enumerator and uh, the uh, what exactly that they're, um, they're uh, doing. So it is, yeah, you saw that on the last slide, yeah. This one's a lot harder to see just because it's just so much more densely packed. Um, it's much easier to see. Uh, next time I do this, I will remember to kind of break it down and go, okay, here's the first half and here's the second half. Because uh, um, the great thing about doing research digitally though, or like uh, electronically online, is that you can take it and you can blow it up and you can really see what's on there. Um, but this is, it's just an example to kind of show you that, you know, it can, 
it can be look very simple and you can pretty much read what's on here um, to, okay, I really got to blow that one up. Um, I don't print these out because they never print out all that well. Um, I just use them almost exclusively uh, uh, online now, but I keep a copy of them. Like this is just from my own uh, personal uh, collection. Um, I can't even read it well enough to know uh, who exactly this person, uh, these people are. I think it's the Robinsons. I think it's that side of my family, but uh, yeah, it's definitely Nova Scotia. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, oh, I did something I missed that I, I uh, wanted to talk about. If anybody's doing any Irish, I saw a lot of people doing Irish uh, type of um, uh, genealogy. That's one of the countries where a lot of the records, especially censuses and uh, vital records, some of the wills were destroyed um, in 1922. Uh, there was a public records office fire during the uh, the troubles there, and uh, substitute records are now being used in order to uh, try to supplement uh, the lack of those re uh, records. So they use things in Ireland like tax assessments, householder indexes, allotment records, and wills, leases, and church records, and immigration records when they can. Um, and there's this project going on called Beyond 2022 where the, um, they're trying to find whatever substitute records they can in order to fill in those gaps because a lot of things from the 19th century were just completely destroyed. All right. So I'm just going to discuss reliability a uh, quickly. So this is just about part of your analyzing your evidence or what records do you have? Like, how do you know when you found something that actually is true and that you can rely upon? So there's something called the genealogical um, standard or a proof standard, and it's got five elements to it. And basically what it's doing is trying to make you have a good conclusion um, based on what you have. And the kind of the basis is for that is finding three independent sources of the information. Um, so independent sources are, um, it's not, you know, like a book and then an article and then um, the actual record where the information comes from, where all of those draw from the same record. It's like you found a birth certificate and then maybe you found a census and then maybe you found another completely independent uh, document, like a will, uh, to prove, yes, that, that was that person's name, that was that person's date of death or birth or whatever. Um, so that's what I mean by that. Um, I talked about online unsourced family uh, trees, so just view them as clues. Don't review them, uh, you know, view them as reliable. Um, I've put here a good article about assessing your record, uh, really good and short um, about how to kind of do this uh, type of um, analysis. Uh, and also, uh, you know, any tip, uh, a tip that I have here is any conclusion you can, uh, that you make can always be reevaluated if new and reliable evidence comes to light. And that's possible nowadays because on a daily basis now, uh, new records are being transcribed, they're being scanned, they're being digitized and put onto so many websites. So it's always possible that if you can't find something now, just look again in six months or a year and you may find what you were looking for. Um, so it's kind of like it's a never-ending thing because you never know quite when you're completely finished um, unless you've done a thoroughly exhaustive search, which is part of the genealogical proof standard as well. So you want to, you know, look at everything that you possibly can. You want to look at reliable independent sources, preferably with original uh, documents uh, that were made at the time by witnesses to the event. and. You want to um, make sure that if you have conflicting or contradictory information, try to sort that out. Try to see which, what is, you know, more accurate and more reliable and what you can, uh, you can base your um, conclusion on. So, for example, a birth date from a birth record is probably more accurate and reliable than a birth date derived from a census record. So there's kind of a hierarchy. So when I talk about original records, uh, a census is not one of them. You know, a book wouldn't be one of them. Um, a transcript wouldn't, something that someone's, uh, you know, taken 
they've taken the information and said, this is what it says. Always go back to the original, which I said before. Um, so it's just, it's a good part of your analysis to do that. Oh, and by the way, this is, um, this is the uh, picture here is uh, for my uh, ancestor uh, from the town of Lyman, Connecticut. Uh, his name's Aaron Huntley. He, uh, this is his will. Uh, it was uh, probated in 1745, so that means after he dies, the will needs to be probated or accepted uh, by the court. And uh, it's pretty cool that it's in this good of condition still. Um, and it notes what records are with that um, particular one. And I do have those records as well. So just to kind of um, round out your genealogical research, it's always a great idea to look at social and local history because as much as you might want to know names and dates and locations, most people also want to know how did my ancestor live? Why did they live the way that they did? Why did they make the choices that they did? Um, and the, you know, background information about historical, environmental, educational, political, social, economic, and religious settings in which an individual or family live can really uh, give you insight into how they lived and why they lived the way they did. Um, and cultural information, of course, is part of this. Um, and it may explain a lot, too, because customs of uh, religious customs, social customs, and ethnic uh, group customs um, can uh, help you also in your research. Uh, for example, a lot of places have naming practices. Uh, like They're called patronymics. Uh, some of them are called patronymics. And it'll help you to figure out who's who and uh, who is your definite ancestor. Because sometimes the, it, these uh, ethnic groups, they'll name the father, you know, it, it'll be like George, James, uh, Aaron, John. And then, then you know, the kids will be the same names. Um, they don't vary a lot. So you may have um, a whole bunch of people you're looking at and it's like, well, which George is mine? Um, you'll start to understand based on these naming practices and the history and the location and the records that you're using, how to figure out which one's yours. So personally, for me, I'm really interested in who my ancestors are, but I'm also interested in how they lived. So I uh, tend to do quite a bit with uh, social and local history as well um, to develop my research. So I want to talk now. Oh, I did have a research tip here, sorry. Um, Local historical societies in a location where you're researching your family, definitely check those out because I think that they will at least give you a better understanding of uh, your family there and then it, um, but also may have some great uh, resources for you to look at uh, to learn a bit more. So let's talk about DNA. Um, I don't know how many people have done a DNA test. Uh, I'm one who has. I don't know if anybody else has. If they have, does anybody want to share? Um, no, you don't have to, I'm just, <laughs> if you have, can you tell me where you took it from? Like the company you took it from, like say Ancestry, 23andMe, uh, Living DNA, Family Tree DNA. Uh, personally, I've taken mine with Ancestry, okay. We've got some ancestry, some family tree DNA, ancestry. Yeah, and I, probably most people will start with 23andMe or ancestry. Um, uh, it depends kind of sometimes why you wanted to do it. If you wanted to do it with health, uh, for a while there, 23andMe was the only one you could do it with, but there's a few others now. Uh, ancestry, definitely a lot of people do that, and it has probably the best ethnicity predictors because of the database size it has. Uh, so a lot of people do that, and on here you'll see on this slide my uh, ancestry DNA story. Uh, so it says that uh, you know, as I said, like my background is England and Northwest Europe, for the most part, um, 44%. Then Scotland, 28%. Welsh, I'm 15%. Ireland, 7%. Norway, 3%. Don't know how I've never been able to trace how I have Norwegian blood. And then Germanic Europe is 3% as well, which isn't surprising because a lot of 
you know, people do come from, uh, do uh, mix around as well in uh, Europe. The thing you should know about ethnicity results is that they're only good um, uh, back about four to 500 years, as is the DNA that they're looking at as well, because each time um, you go down in history, you're only getting a little bit of DNA from your mom and from your dad, right? And it, it kind of dilutes as you go through. So eventually, it's possible by about your um, about the fourth or fifth generation, you may not have any uh, DNA at all from some of your ancestors that go back, like your four times or five times great grandparents. So um, that also kind of explains why siblings, you know, you'll have very different um, ethnicities sometimes, whereas someone's like, well, I got, you know, 66% Irish, but my sister only got like 46%. Like, why did that happen? It's just they got the, the chromosomes and the DNA from um, their Irish grandparent more than our ancestor more than you did. So most people take, um, you know, reason, the reasons for DNA are health and medical traits, ancestry and lineage are, you know, family trees, and then cousin finding. People sometimes just want to find other people that are related to them. So for those, uh, it, they use adosomnal DNA or at DNA. They might also call it admixture DNA. So it's just the, um, the way they test it. Um, and it, that's the one that's used mainly by Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, MyHeritage, and Family Tree DNA. And that's where you'll find uh, health type of uh, information, but also the ethnicity predictors. Um, and each company has a different way of or algorithm to determine what is uh, your ethnicity based on the database, so the samples that they have. So um, as I was saying, Ancestry has the largest database, so they're probably the most um, the most reliable uh, right now. Um, but that doesn't mean the other ones aren't either, because some of them have more from uh, like living DNA is very good for British and Welsh um, uh, DNA results and ethnicity. So it just really depends what the company has in their database and who's testing with them. So there are also, um, so at DNA looks at all the chromosomes, 1 through 22, as well as the X chromosome, which is, uh, you know, the female chromosome. Um, so anybody can have this type of uh, um, test done. But there are two other types of tests um, that a lot of people use, especially if you're doing really in-depth uh, research. So you may uh, f uh, hear about Y DNA. Y-DNA is the male chromosome, so it's only inherited from father to son, and so only can be taken by males. But this is something that can uh, show you deep ancestry, so way back, past 500 years. So it's not great for genealogical purposes, but it is great for um, uh, finding common, you know, like does someone have a common ancestor somewhere? Um, and uh, where do you come from? Do you come from, you know, more Europe or do you come from more Africa? That kind of thing. And then we also have uh, mitochondrial or mtDNA, and that's something anybody can have tested. It's inherited from the mother to the child, um, and it's used to just uh, explore a person's direct maternal line. So your Y DNA is your paternal line, your MT DNA is your uh, maternal line. So depending on what you want to do, that'll uh, um, you know determine what kind of test you want to take. For example, my dad had a Y DNA test taken as well as an at uh, an autosomal DNA test, and the Y DNA test showed that his Haplo group, this is the deep ancestry speak, uh, it was attached to approximately 50% of uh, European descended males. So he's in a big group. <laughs> Doesn't really tell you much else uh, than that. So family tree DNA is the one that does these uh, mitochondrial and Y DNA tests for the most part. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, issues that can be raised through um, doing uh, DNA tests. And I think that people need to be aware of these before they decide to do it. Um, doesn't mean you might decide not to, but it's good to be aware of this kind of stuff. Um, 
especially like privacy issues, they have been much more um, a hot topic, especially since uh, the advent of genetic genealogy and forensic genealogy, uh, because they are finding people that are criminals, not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, through uh, DNA of um, ancestors or DNA of living uh, cousins. And uh, that, for some people, raises some issues because of consent. Uh, now there are, it's much stricter, and uh, even the public um, DNA sites that you can upload your DNA results to, such as GenMatch.com, this is the one that the, um, most uh, police uh, agencies use. Um, they used to be completely publicly accessible, and that's how um, this Golden Gate, uh, Golden State killer was uh, found. Um, now you have to kind of opt in. Do you want your DNA to be used for um, uh, legal purposes, like uh, criminal uh, purposes? And you can opt in and say that, but it used to not be like that. So a lot of people were pretty, uh, oh, God, you know, like I only consented to putting my DNA up. I didn't consent to people using that for other purposes. So it's, um, and different countries have different privacy codes too. So here in the States where most of the DNA testing happens, it's laxer than you will find in uh, European states. So it's always kind of good to look at the privacy codes and looking to what exactly are you agreeing to when you upload your DNA. Um, and even, you know, another one is ownership. Do you even own the DNA results? Um, because it goes through a test. Um, uh, some of these uh, companies you don't. As much as what you do with your DNA uh, and the, the actual DNA is your um, personal information, um, some of these companies have ownership over the results of your uh, DNA. So a lot of people are not comfortable with that. And like, you know, as uh, Brenda said, if she's anti-DNA, uh, you know, freaks you out a bit. Um, I, I totally understand that, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, for me, I guess, you know, it, it made sense for me and the genealogical research I was doing, and we had some uh, issues that we were trying to sort out in my family, so we went ahead and a whole bunch of us had had it done. But, you know, these things, as a, I'm trained as a lawyer too, um, they do make me concerned. But I am happy to see that um, more protection of individual rights is happening. Uh, it's just, uh, I don't know if it's going to be complete. So it's just something to think about before you uh, do a DNA test. Uh, they're just not for fun. <laughs> um, so um, another issue could be accuracy um, in that sometimes rarely there are tran transcription record, um errors made, but it's really rare and it's not something that you should really be concerned about. More it's about you'll get different results from different tests. Uh, so you are you may be uh, prone to go, well, why does my DNA keep changing? Your DNA is not changing. It's uh, the results of it based on the algorithms and testing methods used by these different places. Um, so suddenly, you know, I mean, when I first started doing ethnicity tests, I was uh, like 65% uh, British, and that's all they had. Uh, now suddenly it's been broken down. So it looks like my DNA has changed. No, it hasn't. It's just become, in the ethnicity results, just more refined. Uh, my husband just had his uh, updated, and all of a sudden he's, uh, he has like a 1% or 2% Aboriginal. Uh, he didn't have that before. So. It changes, but the lower, you know, anything below like two or three percent, it may be a false positive anyway. <laughs> so just keep that in mind too. Um, so I'm not trying to freak you out about DNA. I'm just trying to kind of uh, say, well, I think they're a great tool. And, uh, you know, I think it's really interesting what's happening on, you know, with regards to genetic uh, genealogy and forensics. Uh, but it's, you know, it's not for everyone and, you know, if you uploaded uh, your DNA like 10 years ago, you had no idea that this could be an outcome of it. So uh, it's good to keep on track of what's happening too. I'm uh, also going to talk in the next one about these non-expected parent um, 
issues. So DNA surprises or what is in your DNA. When you do go and get a DNA test, um, I think that before you do it, you should be aware that you can get a surprise. And they're called non-expected or um, parents or NEPs. And uh, now they've done uh, statistics and analysis to uh, realize that about 10% of every generation, uh, you know, throughout history, um, have a non-expected parental um, surprise in them. So this means this is not the, the biological parent you expected to find. And it could be hundreds of years back, or it could be more recent. And uh, for the more recent stuff, people didn't talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, they felt that it was not something that, that should be out there. Some people didn't know. Um, some people may feel betrayed because no one told them. Um, but it may not have been well known, or it may have just have been, well, we don't talk about that kind of thing. Uh, so <laughs> I'm just saying that you may have one in your family that you discover through DNA testing. Um, it is not the end of the world, but it is a shock, and it can be something that can be very, um, for some people, really shake them to the core of their identity. And it's just something that has to be dealt with. And I think if you're someone who's like, I don't want to know that kind of stuff, then don't do a DNA test uh, because it's not it might not be for you. Um, and I honestly, um, I've had some in my family, which were a complete shock because I have done my genealogy and I've done my documentation and I've followed the genealogical proof standard. And on paper, my genealogy is solid going back five, six, seven generations or more. Um, so when we did uh, some at uh, the autosomal DNA tests through, um, we did them through Ancestry and through Family Tree DNA. Uh, I did them, my parents did them, uh, some of my relatives did them. So we had a whole bunch um, because the, we had some interesting, when I initially did it, I had some interesting matches and I'm like, okay, that's different. Uh, so we found out that we've had one or two of these non-expected uh, parental uh, you know, um, surprises in our past. So that led to some uh, big shock, especially for me, because I'm like, wait a minute, I've done mine. So on paper, on the records, no indication of this. Uh, so it may lead you to really, I, I went back and checked my DMI, uh my research, but it was solid. So it was like, this was not going to be discovered through doing traditional genealogical research. So it led to some difficult conversations, uh, deciding do we tell people, do we not tell people? Like, how do you proceed? Do you share, do you not share? Um, so there are ways now, you know, looking back and with my experience, and I've read a lot now too, of course, because it's really hard to tell, you know, an elderly person, oh, hey, um, uh, yeah, I don't think that your, you know, your parent was who you think they are. Do you really want to tell them that? Um, it's, uh, yeah, as, uh, as um, Joanna's saying, it is a very challenging situation. Um, so there's ways to kind of prepare yourself beforehand if you are someone who's doing DNA tests and administering them on behalf of others or asking them and you're the one who's going to get the results is to kind of just say, hey, how do you feel if we find out a surprise? Do you want to know? Because some people won't. And then you don't share that information with them because they've told you they don't want to know. Um, and then the test taker can make an informed choice too about do they really want to do this? Because um, I'm i of the view that I'd want to know. No matter how upsetting that information would be, I'd want to know because I'm someone who believes, you know, the truth is the truth and uh, you just deal with it. Um, but for a lot of people, it's it could just be hurtful. Uh, and you don't want, you know, they just don't want to know, like that's just not okay, especially older generations. Um, so what do you do if you do find this out? Well, first thing that you want to do is um, you want to confirm it. You want to make sure, yes, this is definitely what this says. <laughs> um, don't, you know, like uh, 
confirm it with someone who knows what they're doing with DNA, um, talk to, you know, if the person that's affected wants to know it, talk to them about it, and you break it slowly and gently. You do it um, very carefully after you're absolutely sure about your, co your conclusion. Um, and even if the relationship's hundreds of years back that you've just discovered, even just 100 years back, it'll shake people because you grow up with a certain story and then you finally you find out, oh, this is another story. Like for me and my family, we found out about these things when I was like 47. Uh, so these are not things that are completely going to change my life. And after, I, you know, we got over the shock of it, it was like, oh, okay, all right. Like one of my grandparents is, uh, you know, not my biological uh, grandparent, but I grew up with them. That's That's who they are. And I've never, you know, had... I, I, do, I don't have a different thought process about them or how I feel, you know, like they're, they're that person and I never knew the other one. Um, but it really can shake you to the core and to try to help someone through with this, it's really, it's, it's difficult. So um, there's lots of uh, ways to deal with it too. Like it, a lot of families will not want to know. You'll have people going, why are you bringing this up? Um, you know, you're, I just wouldn't want to know, like one of my sisters was like, I can't believe you did this. Uh, and it caused some challenging conversations for a while. We got through it, but, um, it, it can also be hard, like, um, to support someone going through this. If you don't understand, well, what's the big deal? It was a couple, you know, it was a hundred years ago or 200 years ago. What do we care? Well, don't minimize their feelings or, you know, or you know, realize that they're deeply affected by this. It could be something, you know, like um, more recent, like, oh, I just discovered I have another sister or a brother or, you know, my mom has a sister or a brother she didn't know about. Like, these things really can shake people to the core. So just, you know, you support, you might not understand, but don't minimize how they feel. And if you're the person who is getting this uh, shocking news, let yourself calm down, reach out, get some support. There's tons of support from, you know, Facebook groups, uh, you know, that would do this to um, talking to someone individually, um, you know, talking to someone like me who's, okay, we've been through some stuff here. And I know some people have gone through, uh, you know, similar situations or worse, or worse uh, situations. And it's always uh, good to just kind of give yourself some time. Don't confront anybody uh, if you're angry or feeling raw. And I can tell you, like, it's been a year now since we found out in my family, and it's much better. Uh, we figured out a way to go forward, and um, life kind of goes on as usual. It's like a blip that you get through. So anyways, I just wanted to share that because this is happening more and more and more. Um, I've read tons of books on this now, of course, and there's podcasts out there about this, but it is something that was never meant to, you know, come out or that previous generations ever thought was possible to come out, which now everywhere you turn, someone's talking about a DNA surprise. So, um, you know, it could happen. I hope it doesn't, uh, but, uh, you know, when you have uh, statistics like 10% of each generation has one of these, you know, NEPs in them, <laughs> it's a pretty good uh, possibility it could happen. Um, so, Lori, uh, because of the type of DNA testing, it would be very unlikely that these results could be a false positive, right? Yeah, DNA doesn't lie. There are, I don't even know if there's a case, and if there is, it's maybe one or two of uh, false positives um, or, uh, you know, Linking up someone with a parent that's not actually their parent, no, I don't think that that would be happening. Um, DNA is very, like how they test it, uh, that's very solid. Um, the errors that I think would occur in DNA testing right now are, are with ethnicity um, or it's not with paternity. So I don't think, it would be pretty rare, um, the only type, um, possibility is that perhaps the transcription error has occurred and you can go to the um, company and you know see if that's a possibility um, but they actually have people at these uh, genealogy uh, places um, these um, 
uh, sorry, these um, companies uh, that actually kind of almost specialize in talking to people that are going through this because there really aren't false positives um, or false negatives. And, you know, like the DNA says what it does. Um, transcription errors, as I said, that's pretty rare and it still probably would not result in a the wrong parent being identified. Like fraternity type stuff has been around for a really long time and it could be that further out your relationships with people may not be completely clear. Is it like a second cousin or a third cousin? Um, that's a possibility where the relationship is not exactly clear, but the fact that you have DNA in common will be. I uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, and I'm not trying to freak anybody out. I just uh, I, I just think that this isn't something you take uh, lightly. <laughs> and uh, I honestly uh, I wouldn't have done anything different, honestly. And if I knew wh what I was going to find out, I probably would have done it anyways. I just would have been better prepared. <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions about DNA that they want to ask or any experiences that they want to share? Or if I, you know, oh, I, I, I'm getting used to being super vulnerable uh, about stuff like this. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Joanna. It's uh, it, it's not the easiest thing to talk about, but I think you know more and more people that talk about these things, it'll be easier for others to deal with and you know to get that knowledge out there. Um, I'm gonna go on then. We're almost finished. Sorry, I think it's taken a little long. I'm gonna quickly finish. Um, so. Final remarks. <laughs> Yay, we got there. Um, brick walls. So brick walls are something that you inevitably hit. You just can't go any more forward or you can't conclude something. You just can't find anything else. Um, that's the time to kind of just step back, double check your research, maybe redirect your you know, goals or your research to other family uh, lines because that one's just not going anywhere. Um, and you know, I've had one that lasted like up until last year, uh, so like almost 15 years, and it was so frustrating, and I so could not figure it out. And you know, I know what I'm doing. I'm looking in the right places, uh, and it's just nothing's really you know out there. And then, um, and of course, they had a common uh, you know last name White. You can't get much more common than White unless it was Jones or Smith. So, uh, oh, thank you, Brenda. So I finally figured out, I had to ignore the family story that told me that there was a family of three girls. Um, they're from England. And when the great grandmother married my great grandfather and moved to Canada, that was the first time anybody in that family had ever, ever been to Canada. So I took that and I didn't, you know, it was always in the back of my mind. So I ignored a passenger record that I had found. And I was like, huh, but then I found a census and they were all in Canada. And I'm like, what's going on? And I finally figured out that part of that family had moved to Canada for 10 years, farmed in Saskatchewan and then moved back. Like no idea about that. So that is definitely, um, I was so happy to find that. But then I also realized, well, you know what? There was two sons in this family that no one talked about. Why didn't anybody, you know, know about this? And uh, I started to find a ton of information about them. And um, yeah, it was just like, it, I went from like total frustration for 15 years to bang, okay. You know, I just need to look at this in a little bit of a different way, not trust what I've heard. Um, even though I hadn't found anything to that point to distrust, to make me distrust it. And I filled out this family line and I went back two more generations after that. So it was just, sometimes you just got to stick to it. You got to take back, you got to go look at records. Uh, every year I go and I look to see what's new out there to see if anything can help me with brick walls. <clears throat> Cause as I said, there's, you know, things are being constantly put onto, um, online, even if you can't get to um, a place in person, maybe you can find something online. <coughs> uh, 
it is like a family scavenger hunt. Um, yeah, it can be, but I can't tell you how happy I was when I finally solved it. And I went and I'm like, dad, I finally figured this out. And he's like, uh huh. Like, <laughs> People are sometimes not as excited about your discoveries as you are. Also, how do you keep yourself from burning out or getting overwhelmed? Well, there's nothing wrong with stepping back. There's nothing wrong with just putting it away for a while and coming back to it or going back to the basics. And you know what? You're never really alone in this. If you want, you're finding you're not getting anything from your family and you want some support, get out there and see, you know, like join a society or join one of these Facebook groups and, um, you know, it's kind of fun to share with other people and, or, you know, call me. <laughs> I'll talk to you about your genealogical stuff. I find it really interesting. <laughs> and I'm serious about that because, uh, you know, by helping others, I can also help myself. And uh, I've learned a lot of stuff through helping others because I don't have everybody's ethnicity or, you know, uh, ancestors and what they did. So, yeah. Um. So Beth has asked me, what's my most interesting find about my past or my lineage? Huh. I have a, you know, a bunch of them that are interesting. I am, like most people, I don't have anybody really famous in my background, um, you know, except for maybe the Mayflower <laughs> incident. Um, I do have a, um, you know, the Salem witch trials. I actually do have a, um, a witch in my uh which my husband says explains some things, haha. -ha. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I actually had someone during the Salem witch trials who confessed to being a witch. She was the only one to do so. It actually saved her from being uh, hanged. And uh, yeah, so that was pretty interesting. As for an artifact, like an actual thing that I have, um, I don't think I have anything too exciting. Um, I'm trying to think. Not really. Like we haven't, you know, like the oldest thing that I probably have besides like maybe some coins um, is uh, the dolls that uh, I was talking about from the 19th century. They're actually of Mary Lincoln and Todd, um, sorry, Abraham Lincoln. And uh, uh, the reason we have them in our family is because uh, if you go back far enough, one of my great great grandfathers was a, uh, a Lincoln from uh, Massachusetts and he was a cousin probably a very distant cousin of Abraham Lincoln. So that's why we have that. So uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. That's a cool story, Jen. That's a Thank cool you. Story. Yeah, totally cool. And you know what? Everybody has these in their, in their families. It could, you know, not very famous or, you know, interesting on paper people, but I found it really interesting. And my nephews love the fact that we're all descended from a witch. They think this, that's, um, you know, fantastic. So, <laughs> um, I have one other tip, and it's uh, if you're going to, you're really into this, and you're going forward, and you, you know, maybe not exhausted your family sources and the internet and the family history centers and everywhere that you can go to, you know, get your information. But you may want to travel to the places your ancestors lived, or to visit courthouses, churches, cemeteries, and other places where old records are kept. This is like, it's a really rewarding experience to walk in the footsteps of your ancestors and to bring their heritage to life and to see how they lived. Um, it's like a quest to discover something that's fun, but it's exciting, like a detective story. It's definitely never ending, uh, but it's something that, uh, uh, like I'm definitely planning on doing this hobby for the rest of my life. Um, and I'm definitely planning on doing some research trips when we get back to the mainland. Um, and I actually really can't wait. <laughs> uh, and it'll, I think my husband is equally as excited about his as well, although we have to do a little bit more, uh, research on that. But, uh, yeah, it's a great, it's, uh, maybe it's something you can do with your husband or your, uh, you know, like your partner or again, as with your children. So, I'm leaving you, oh, so my coordinates are here if you ever want to call me. I don't know if you can see my email all that well. It's ljsm2016 at gmail.com. And there's my cell right there, which is uh, good so long as I stay in Hawaii. Um, got to put up a few more images from my own personal records. Uh, and this is a, 
this is four generations right here. This is my great great grandfather, my great grandmother, my grandfather, and my father. <laughs> so that was taken in 1946. So if you're hooked, or you're just looking to get into this a little bit more, um, look into various you know courses offered at reasonable prices or free. Look at those seminars. Look at Roots Tech, you know, coming up in February. Um, there's tons of helpful guides and publications out there. I love to watch uh, the shows. So uh, you can watch, you know, Who Do You Think You Are, uh, The Genealogy Roadshow, Finding Your Roots, History Detectives, Addicts and uh, Ancestors in the Attic, and Faces of America. Some of these are British, some of them are American, some of them are Canadian, but there's a whole bunch of shows out there. And the, another one is The Genetic Detective. And also, if you're a reader, there's even genealogical mystery types. Uh, and my favorite author is Nathan Dillon Goodwin. He's British, uh, but he just wrote a story about uh, the states as well, based in Utah, in Salt Lake City. And that is where the Family History Library is for family search. It's this massive place that almost looks like a temple of a research to ge uh, genealogy. Fascinating place. Tons of magazines that you can check out. I have, um, I think I have one actually right here. Yeah, the Family Tree magazine. So this one's a great one to look at. There's also a Who Do You uh, Think You Are magazine that's more British based. And podcasts, tons of podcasts out there. There's blogs out there. Um, there's so much that you can do. You can even volunteer to transcribe and scan uh, records, post photos from local cemeteries. There's tons of ways you can get involved and do things as well. Um, so I have talked for quite a while and I'm very thankful for you to all join me. Um, and I hope you found some interesting, uh, you know, some interest here and some things that can help you. As I said, here's an appendix with general websites. Um, one that I didn't talk about uh, before was Internet Archive, also called the Wayback Machine. It has old uh, websites archived there, and also you can find books that are uh, out of copyright so that you can download. And tons of those 19th century genealogies and uh, local histories are on there. And also, Appendix B, I have three pages of Appendix B, and there's some websites by country, region, ethnicity, that kind of thing, to kind of get you started. And I've covered Canada, US, Australia, France, UK. There's also Africa and African American, Af American Indigenous, Canadian Indigenous. Uh, so Michelle, if you're still on here, there's one for you. Uh, Central and South American, Chinese, more based uh, kind of to the US, but Chinese, Eastern European and Russian, German, Indian, but the subcontinent, uh, Japan, Jewish, uh, so for a cultural uh, ethnicity, and Scandinavia. So those are places that'll get you started. And yes, you should get a copy of those uh, last slides. Uh, I believe that this will be uh, put on with uh, my, uh, um, my talk later on the YouTube channel. So uh, if anybody has any questions that I haven't answered so far, uh, this is a good time to talk about them. Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I'll am i stick around for a while if people want to just chat. Um, and I just really wanted to say thank you for joining me and uh, letting me share a little bit of my passion uh, and something that helps me to connect with my family and uh, with others because I get to help too. So I really hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, Jen. That was awesome. You're welcome.